Okay, I think we'll get started. Um, hello and welcome to this the Archer 2 for Data Scientist course, which we're running today. Um, I've put my camera on just so I can say hi to everybody. Um, I won't leave my camera on just mainly because my connection to the internet is not always brilliant, so it can slow down the the upload of the, the sound and the slides. Um, so, but I wanted to say hi to start with. Um, just to make you all aware that these uh, lectures have been recorded. Uh, so we routinely record the, the courses that we give for H2 and publish them online uh, just for, for people to come back to and look at uh, later, remind themselves or to, to go through if they um, haven't been on the course. If you've got any problems with that, let us know. Uh, but in general, we'll, we, we tend to record these things. Um, and uh, just to say that we do this course as a mixture of lectures and practical exercises. So there'll be some parts where I'm presenting and uh, some parts where you're working on Archer 2 and, and uh, running some little examples and, and trying out some of the things from the lectures. But if you have any questions as we're going on, whilst I'm giving the lectures or at any point, then feel free to jump in and ask. So you don't have to wait till the end of the lectures or to practical sessions. Um, either I'll try and keep an eye on the chat window. So if you have any questions, you can you can type them in there um, as we're going along or um, just unmute your mic and ask a question and uh, we can pick it up as well. So uh, both of those are fine. Um, just do jump in if you have questions. I should say my name's Adrian Jackson. Um, I'm part of the Arch2 team here at uh, EPCC at Edinburgh, um, and I'm going to give a, a course today. And we have other people along to help out if we have uh, issues in the practical sessions as well. So let me just get my slides going. All our uh, material that we're using today is online um, and shareable. Uh, so all the training content is given under a Creative Commons license, so you can take it and use it yourselves if you want to. This is being given as part of the Archer 2 service, as part of the Archer 2 system. Uh, you are here on the course, so you probably have some awareness of what Archer 2 is, but in case it's not, not entirely clear, Archer 2 is a large compute resource or compute service which is provided by UKRI, but primarily, primarily by EPSRC for researchers to undertake activities on. Um, and so it's a, a large CRA system, which we'll come on to look at, uh, but we operate it at EPCC on behalf of the research councils. As part of that service, there's also training, um, which which this is one example of, but we have a wide range of courses on the website, um, uh, uh, online and face-to-face, -face, with a, uh, an aim to try and make using a system like Archer 2 either more efficient or easier. So we recognize and everybody recognizes that using a large scale parallel computer like Archer 2 may not be straightforward. Um, and we also want to get the best out of this system. So make its use uh, as efficient as possible and so we we offer a range of courses from sort of beginner let's get on the system how do you use it which is what this kind of course is this arch for data scientists is uh is more an entry level how do we get on and how would we use an arch two for our data science but we also run courses all the way up to um you know how do you do advanced parallel programming to make applications uh, more efficient or scale up to large resources uh, in case you're interested, this is this is what Archer 2 looks like. Um, so it sits out at uh, um, the university's data centre, which is about uh, six, seven miles outside Edinburgh, um, and it sits in a big room with lots of uh, lots of cooling and uh, electricity running into it. It has a nice picture sitting on the front of it, uh, but no, most of us don't get to see that because it's locked away in a room and we don't actually go into the the facility. Uh, really. And then if you actually looked inside these cabinets, you'd see they're full of computers, obviously, but cables and plumbing is the other feature. So there's a lot of 
uh, active plumbing these big silver um things on the top of uh, uh, pipes on the top of the uh, cabinets there taking the hot and cold water through to to cool the system um, and then all the cables uh, the networking to connect all the computers together as i say we run a lot of courses as part of a service and you can find details along with other things like virtual tutorials documentation those kind of things online uh, through the arch2 website which I assume you're aware of because that's why you're here. Um, as I said, my name is Adrian Jackson. Uh, if you need to get in touch with me either now or, or later after the course, that's perfectly fine. Here's my email address. Feel free to, to drop me an email if there's any questions that come up um, either during or after the course. As I say, you can also use the chat feature on the, on the Collaborate platform we're using here. Um, I'm teaching this course. I've taught quite a few of the Arch2 courses over the years, uh, but primarily I actually do research into high performance and parallel computing. Um, I haven't shown you it yet, but actually I could show you it now. Uh, let me share you a slightly different page. So stop sharing this page, these slides, but share um, a Chrome tab. So this is the web page hopefully that'll come through in a second for you there you go this is the web page of the course um a rough timetable i'll warn you now but uh, we'll try and stick to stick to the breaks uh, but the lecture material and the practical material will probably get slightly um disjointed from the, this timetable because some of the lectures take a little bit longer um than others but actually we have a reasonable amount of time in the afternoon for, for practical sessions an hour here um half an hour here where we can catch up anyway um you'll have seen this this is where you could register for a course but we've got some new links on the page now so there's one here to course materials and there's one here to course chat so course chat takes us to another place where you can ask um questions and uh type in those kind of things so that's another useful place you can put in uh i should really update that shouldn't i, I should just say oh three uh 24 that's perfectly fine um but you can also add comments and questions in there if that's useful uh, particularly as we're going through the practical sessions if there's things you don't understand you can put them in there and then here the course materials button takes us to a github repository for this course um, and this includes all the lectures that I'm going to give today um, and also the practical um, source code and handouts from what we're going to do today so this is something that will you can take away but also we can use today on the system to get access to the practical uh, sessions and exercises so it's linked off the off that web page that we're using today but i'll also put it in today's chat and in that uh, scratch pad thing um so you can easily link it oh, it's already in that scratch pad thing actually because we already saw that before uh, so if i go here yeah there's already a link to it there so if you need that uh, then please um go and find it in any one of those places there will also be another thing that comes up here at the end of uh, the course, which is a feedback form. So I'll go back to my slides now. Give me a second. Um, so we will send you a feedback form at the end of, uh, I'll remind you, or Claire will send around at the end of the uh, session of feedback form for course, which is always very useful to us. It's pretty straightforward. Um, there's a, how would you rate this course overall? And then there's spaces for, for giving more detailed feedback. It is useful. It is nice to know whether it was worthwhile or not, or whether there's things you'd change or not. So we will remind you later, but at the end of the course, if you have five minutes and could provide the feedback, it would be great. Beyond that, Archer 2 has a support desk or a help desk um, so if you have queries and, and questions outside this course and 
for usage of Archer in general, Archer 2 in general, then there's a, an email address you can use there to send those in. And there's a, there's a whole team of people who, who field those and, and provide information. And if you, if you do this course and are then massively enthused about high performance computing and uh, data analytics and machine learning and high performance, then we also run um, uh, have postgraduate training in these kind of things as well. So we have a master's program. So you can go and have a look at that if you want. I assume that's not why most of you are here, but uh, we, we uh, it would be remiss of me not to mention it. Oh, I see. Let me have a look in the chat. Uh, you can't see my shared screen. Let me just stop sharing and start to sharing again, just to make sure it comes through OK. You should be able to see my slide at the moment I'm on. Uh, I've just stopped and I'll start again. I'm on the still on the first lecture, but on the you should see a slide saying access during the course now. Um, it's come up on my window, but let me know if it, it doesn't come up with you as well. Um, I'll keep going for now, but do, do, do send me another message if you still can't see it. Um, you can, um, so part of the, okay, it's still not coming up. Is, can anybody else see my uh, window? Is it uh, not coming up for everybody? Okay. Um, so if you could maybe, one of the ways, so this, um, unfortunately, this collaborate thing we use here is not always 100% reliable. So if you're still not a screen, yeah, try logging, try logging out, try logging back in again and see if it comes up. And yes, that's a good point. There is a, um, it does work better in Chrome than it does in Firefox, which is annoying. Well, so wait one second. Um, the, uh, the other thing I should remind you of at the moment is it's now a good time to make sure you have an account on Archer 2. So that's what we're talking about here. Archer 2, we're going to use for practical sessions. We give you the potential to have a account specifically for this course. So if you don't already have an Archer 2 account, uh, you will have been able to sign up for an account on the system. You have to apply for that through our SAFE website and get access, and we have to approve it. Um, and then we can use that. If you don't already have that and you haven't done that, now is a good time to do that. Um, the details should be in the email from the training people, Claire, about the course. But if they're not, let me know. If you already have an account on Arch2, because you're um, a member of a different project, but you just come in here to do some training, then you don't have to sign up for a new account. You can use your existing account. Often we we do this in such a way that you get access to special queues, special reservations on the system um, if you uh, sign up to a cost account, but we're not using those at the moment anyway. So uh, none of that matters. So you can just use your normal account. If we're on Archer 2, um, these accounts you're given will last for today and for a month after today. So they run for a whole month after the course, which gives you access to the system and a small amount of time to run things in the system. Um, after that month, the account will be closed. So you stop having a budget to be able to run things. And then two weeks later, they, they get deleted. Um, so but all that means is if you want to keep any files from today, then you need to copy them off in a month and a half's time, otherwise you lose them. All of this reference material, though, as I say, will be online ad infinitum or for as long as we run the website for. So um, so the GitHub and, and all that kind of stuff won't go away. All our H2 courses have a code of conduct, which basically means be a nice person, don't be horrible. It tends not to be a big issue on online courses, but we, we run them under the same code of conduct as we have for. I should say it tends not to be an issue on any courses, but uh, even less so on online courses. Uh, but we run them under a code of conduct, uh, so you should be aware of that. Uh, and if anything goes wrong during this course, which you 
want to report or complain about, then there is a, a, a full uh, procedure for doing that through this code of conduct. As a slight aside here, I should mention that there are funding alongside the training that we run on Arch2 service, there is also funding available for um, porting codes and optimizing codes on Arch2. Uh, and it's run through something called the ECSE program, embedded CSE or uh, computational science and engineering support. Um, and basically it, it's there to to go beyond training and actually do some work on codes to improve their performance or functionality on a system like Arch2. Uh, it's quite a nice little funding scheme. Uh, you can get either people from EPCC to work for you, or you can get money to employ people locally to work on codes. Have a look at the website here. Um, unfortunately, we've sort of come in, there isn't an open call for this funding at the moment. There may be another one in the future. Um, but we've sort of come, we've come to the end of the first lot of money for this. Um, there are other calls open at the moment on the same vein, um, particularly focused around GPUs and porting codes to GPUs. Now, Arch2 is not a GPU system, but we recognise, and the UK Research Council has recognised that future systems like Arch2 are likely to be large-scale GPU systems. Um, so there's a, a call open at the moment across all the research councils to fund porting and optimization of applications on GPU calls. And it's off the same web page. So it's worth going to have a look at that if you have any large scale applications or any GPU requirements. And it doesn't have to be PSRC remit in that one. Let me know if you have any questions on that. As I say, um, you can send me an email uh, offline as well. Okay, so what we're looking at here is, is Arch2, which is a large scale HPE Cray system. Um, used to be called Cray, but it was bought by HPE, so it's now HPE Cray. It's nearly 6,000 compute servers or nodes. So those are individual compute units. And each one of those has two processors in it, uh, given as 128 cores, 128 computational workers per node, or up to about three quarters of a million um, workers across the whole system. And it is possible to use all of them in a single job, right? So it's set up in such a way that you can run one big job across all 5,860 nodes. In reality, not all the nodes are always active all the time, because there's always a couple that are broken here or there. But you could definitely run a, a 5,800 node job across the whole system. Um, it, because it's a large-scale parallel system, we use what's called a batch system or a, a queuing system on it. Uh, and the one we're using here is called Slurm. So this is a way of submitting and managing jobs on the system. So you don't get everybody doesn't get access to all the compute nodes all the time. You basically could log into the system on a set of login nodes, and then you prepare a job and you submit it, and then it's run for you at a later date. And this is a, a way of sharing resources and managing the resources across lots of users because Archer 2 has something like three or four thousand users not all of them are active all the time but we can easily have hundreds of active users at any one time all wanting to run jobs so we need systems to manage that demand and, and manage sharing resources uh, fairly between them um there's also two main file systems, so places for storing storing and retrieving data from. Uh, now, normally we wouldn't bother going into this level of detail, but it actually matters because the way this file systems work affects what you can do on the system. And so there's two directories, one called home and one called work. And they're set up like this here, home, project, project, username, work, project, project, username. So basically every project on the system has a a, a, and every user in that project has a directory place to store data on the home file system and in the work file system. If you're using the project for today's course, that's called TA144. And so you'll have a directory in home, TA144, TA144, and then whatever your username is. And you'll also have a directory in work, TA144, TA144, and whatever your username is. The reason we mention this is because 
The work file system is a, is a fast parallel file system designed for high performance. And the home file system is a, is a smaller but backed up and um, you know more um, supported file system for storage of things longer term or well so it's for things there where, where you need to keep that data you can't see the home file system from the compute nodes so anything you want to actually run needs to be on the work file system so all this is a very long-winded way of saying when you log into the system you'll you'll end up on the home file system but that's probably not really where we want to do most of the work today because um, it doesn't actually it's not visible from the compute nodes so we actually go straight to the work file system and do all our work there. Um, as I say, it's long-winded and, and a bit more detail than you need, but hopefully it'll become clear when we when we actually get hands on the system and we get up and get running, that one of the things you need to do, you log into one place, but you need to move to another place in the file systems before we can actually run anything on the computer. Okay. So as I said, the timings will be a little bit fluid today. We're already uh, 15 minutes behind uh, where we were, but uh, that's okay. We've got time time built in the schedule for this. Roughly speaking, we'll look for a break about quarter past, half past 11, and we go for lunch for an hour um, of your own choosing, lunch of your own choosing for an hour at one till two. And then we'll come back in the afternoon and have another break about half past three. Uh, and then, as I said before, there's a mixture of lectures and practicals here. So the exercise sessions, you go off and work on the attitude system, following the instructions uh, in the handouts for those, and then let us know if you have any problems and we'll help out. Uh, the lectures, unfortunately, you have to just sit here and listen to me um, speak. Um, but because we interspersed them, it shouldn't get too boring for you. What we're looking to do today, so that's all, we've, that's, a, that's a lot of introduction. I've not really told you what this course is about. <laughs> so apologies if you sat through that introduction and you realize the course is not for you. Um, what we're looking to do today, this is a self introductory to a course. What we're not trying to do is teach you data science or teach you a particular data science tool to use. What we're trying to teach today in the course or what I'm trying to teach is, okay, H2 is a big compute resource you may be a data scientist or have some data to analyze. How would I do that on Archer 2? What are the ways that I need to do to set up, to run and exploit a large parallel system like this? What are the things I can and cannot do on here? So really we're looking to teach you what Archer 2 is suitable for, how you would run your jobs in data science um, for some definition of data science on the system and what are the things you need to do to make that sure that's using Arch2 efficiently and you're getting good performance out of the system. We're going to focus on setting up Python and R, right? So not really teaching you how to use Python and R, but saying, okay, if you're either doing Python or you're doing R, these are the ways that you would use it on Arch2. Now, I appreciate that's probably, because we do both of them, that probably means half of the time you're not interested because you're either using Python or you're using R. And so the Python bit's not applicable if you're using R, and the R bit's not applicable if you're using Python. But we feel that you know both of these are pretty big tools for data science and data analytics, and so we need to cover them both. Um, so, and some people do use them both as well. So apologies if there's bits where it's not entirely uh, relevant to you, uh, but hopefully you can see from the timetable where those would be. And it may be interesting to you to stick around and, and hear those bits as well, anyway. The other thing we're going to focus on is something called containers. Uh, and that's relevant to everybody. Uh, and containers are just a way of running your own software on Arch2 without um, having necessarily large problems installing it or porting it. So they're a way of supporting a more diverse set of software on a large scale parallel system like this. One of the challenges in the past for systems like Arch2 has been, okay, they've got a fixed software environment, they use this operating system, they have these compilers. And if your code needs something that's not there, it's very hard to, to get it up and running and supported on a system like this. And containers gives us a way of doing that by providing sort of virtual software environments where you can define your own setup 
and you can uh, run that on the system yourself. And so that makes it easier for porting different software to a system like this. And that's what, so we, we'll, we'll look at that first. We'll look at Arch2, what it is. Then we'll look at containers and how you can run, you know, lots of varied software on the system and how that's supported. Uh, and then that takes us up to lunch. Um, and then after lunch, then it's looking at Python first and then looking at R. Um, and you can see uh, potentially in the in the lecture titles here that what we're looking at is parallel Python and parallel R. Uh, and that doesn't mean necessarily a single application where you've parallelized the application, but it basically means how can I run Python on R or R either using parallel Python or R or using lots of uh cores at the same time so lo running lots of copies of my program so i can use all these resources and that's the focus because Archer 2 is set up to be a parallel large-scale system so there's no point coming along really and trying to use it for a single job a single core a small amount of data because that's not what is is provided for it's provided for large-scale work so this is more you want to come to Archer 2 because you've got lots of data to process and it's too slow to do it locally or you've got very large you know, data sets which you can't fit in the memory of a single computer you have access to. Uh, how do I do that and, and, and how do I use the resources in parallel to do that? Hopefully as well, the course will be enjoyable. Um, I can't guarantee you that it will be, but hopefully it'll be interesting and enjoyable. If not, well, there's always a feedback form at the end to let us know and, and we can always uh, change it up for next time. And as I said before, please do ask questions. So please, as we go in along, if there's bits that are not clear, either in the lectures or practicals, then just jump in and say. Any questions before we get on to the first lecture, which I'll just load up now whilst you're, you have a chance to ask them. If not, I will share the next slide. Just wait a second for that to come through. Okay, so we've we've I've um, I've skirted around quite a bit um, the sort of discussions a little bit about uh, Arch two and what it is. So let's go into a bit more detail um, and uh, then take that from there. So this is sort of going to build our understanding of what Arch2 is, and then the bits of that we need to care about when we're looking at running our applications on there, and then how, we, how we're how gonna, um, as it were, tailor our jobs to run on this system to, to, to use this understanding. Okay, so we've already said it, it's, it's nearly, nearly 6,000 compute nodes, and it has these high performance, uh, it has these file systems, Crucially, it also has a high performance network. So what makes this a, a high performance computer really is not just the compute nodes, uh, but it's the compute nodes. So it's large amounts of compute resources uh, alongside an, a very fast and low latency. So uh, a high speed network, which connects those compute nodes together. And then the, the data storage, which is attached to those um, which is attached both to that high-speed network and those compute nodes. We actually have some other components of the system as well. So we have four login nodes, which are the, the places we get to. So we log into and um, do our job development, maybe our code compilation, uh, code editing, those kind of things. Um, and there are also a couple of data analytics nodes. They're called data analytics nodes. There's only two of them. Really, they're sort of there for 
things that you don't want to you don't need to run under full compute nodes but they're a bit too intensive to run on the login nodes which are being shared with people so all things that will run for a long time so quite often we use these data analytic nodes for copying large data sets to and from the file systems or doing a bit of post-processing of data and those kind of things there are um, uh, as i've said a set of uh, parallel file systems um, there's the work ones where we've got about 15 petabytes of storage and work um, and you can access them from everywhere you can access them from the, the login nodes you can access them from the data analytics nodes and crucially you can access them from the compute nodes so this is the work file system is where we do most of our computing from um, there's the home file system where you can see that from the login nodes and the data analytic nodes and nowhere else. It's much smaller, it's only a petabyte, but it is backed up and um, maintained so that if you've got things on there, um, you can you can uh, get access to them if something goes wrong. And so that means that people copy things into the home file system, do some work on them, and then copy them across to the work file system to then run on the back end computer and then copy them backwards and forwards. So it's sort of the stage in place for, for data and code. We also actually have a third file system called a solid, solid state storage file system. That's about another petabyte. Um, and it's also accessible from the same places as the work file system. So you can see it from the uh, login nodes, from the work, um, sorry for compute nodes and the data analytics nodes and it's a bit more of a high performance file system so if you're the most people don't use this but if you've got applications where you're doing lots of reading and writing files so that's part of your requirements then this solid state file system is maybe one we should use instead uh, we don't cover it particularly in the course but if that is your use case then drop me an email i can tell you more about how to use that um what do the actual compute nodes look like themselves? Well, they have two processors in the compute node. So you have these two of these AMD Rome 7742 processors. You don't care what that means, but it means that they are 64 core processors. Um, and then they have some memory and a network attached to them. So the way we're set up on Archer 2, most of the compute nodes have 64 gigabytes of memory. Uh, sorry, yeah have two lots of 64 gigahertz of memory per processor that means that overall most of our compute nodes have 256 gigabytes of memory of active storage alongside of 128 cores so you've got about two cores two gigabytes per core but you can actually use all that memory from any one of those cores we but we also do have some some slightly bigger memory nodes so we have these high memory nodes where they have double that. They have 512 gigabytes of memory. There's about 300 those in the system. So about 300 out of 6,000. It's about 5% or something like that. Um, and then there's a network connection for each one of these. So there's two network connections per node. Um, and they're connecting through into what we call this create slingshot network, which is their high performance uh, data connection. So each each node has 256 gigabytes of memory, but there are some nodes that have 512 gigabytes. High memory nodes. There's, there's not loads of those. There's only 300 high memory nodes. Yeah. So 256 gigabytes is the standard amount of memory per node here on Arch2. And alongside that, you've got 128 processing cores. Um, so if you were to use all those processing cores um, and each one was fairly using the memory, then you have around two gigabytes per processing core. Right? That's what you sort of have in the system as it's set up. As I say, actually, any one core inside this node can use all 256 gigabytes, so you don't have to use all, all the 128 processor cores, but we'll come back to look at that as we go on. Any other questions about the, the compute nodes? Alongside the hardware, 
So we've got file systems, we've got networks, we've got the compute nodes and the memory inside them. Alongside that, we have a set of software which gives us a, an operating environment for the system. So it's a Linux based system. It's, it's what we call HP Cray Linux environment, but really that's um, based on a version of um, uh, scientific Linux as well, scientific Linux 15. So it's pretty standard Linux these days. Um, we are using the Slurm scheduler to access the compute nodes and the data analytic nodes. So we don't directly um, log into those. We only go into the login nodes and then we use the scheduler to run our jobs. And then we have a set of compilers, communication libraries, scientific libraries, all those kind of things for applications and application development. Now in data analytics and, and data science, you probably, a lot of the time, you're not doing the same level of application development that, that others would be. You're not writing a C program or a Fortran program. You might be doing it in Python or R. If you are writing code like C, C++, or Fortran, we have three compilers installed on the system, the Cray ones, which come as default, and then the GNU and the AMD ones. AMD ones because it's got AMD processors, and GNU because they're heavily widely used in the community. We have the Cray MPI and communication libraries for doing parallel applications. And then we have a set of optimized software for applications, such as scientific libraries, which will give you maths libraries like BLAS and LAPAC and SCALAPAC, FFT libraries like FFTW, IO libraries like NetCDF and HDF5, and then Cray's version of, we'll come to CVs, but Cray's version of Python and R which are installed with some optimization to make sure that they give good performance on the system. If you're doing app application development, there's also a set of tools there to help you. So debuggers and profilers, which can tell you what's going on with your code. If, if those are kind of tools you need to new, use or are interested in, there's lots of documentation on the Arch2 website and we run training courses specifically on those things as well. When we access the system, we go in through these login nodes for compilation and general development work. And we have these data nodes for longer running data movement processing tasks. Everything else is on the compute node. So all our big jobs are on the compute nodes. And when you run on a compute node, you require a, a budget. So the system is managed by UKRI or EPSRC, giving out time on the compute nodes. Most time is registered in, in budgets. And so you need an active budget to run a job on the compute nodes. For this course, we've set up a, a project with a budget. And so you, you have um, time on the system to go in and use it and run the practicals and do some exploration. Two things to be aware of. The login nodes um, have this, so the usage of cores on the system, so your computing components, your computing workers, is controlled in two ways. On the login nodes, we have this idea of fair share in the sense that we've got four login nodes, but they're used by a few hundred people at a time. So we don't want people running large amounts of things on there, which will slow other users down. And so it should be set up to share the resources fairly between the users that are logged in. That means you can run things on the login nodes, but they won't necessarily be fast or high performance or do the right, you know, they won't, it won't be useful to run large scale jobs there because the, the, the way that the operating system is set up, it will restrict what you can use down to a, a small portion of a login nodes. The compute nodes, when you access them, you get exclusive access to them. So when you run a job, you get a node or a set of nodes and no one else is using those. That's how the system is set up. Um, but then the, the batch system, the scheduler, controls how you use the hardware. So uh, we'll have a look at this, but there's a thing called binding or placement, which is which of the cores you're using, your things are running on. Um, and that's... If you use all the cores in the system, in the nodes, then everything will just be used and it works uh, no problem. 
that's just an example here this is an example of i've got to set up a job to run on these compute nodes i've got to use a batch system to do it and so i have to write a small script called a batch um script which specifies what i want to run um and the resources i need to run it and here's an example of a batch script so what i've said here it's all using this language called sbatch, um, which is just really comments in a, in a bash script. Um, and I'm saying, I, I'm going to run a job. I'm going to give it a name. You don't have to give it a name, but it just lets you see what's going on in the queue. Um, and then I'm going to ask for two compute nodes. Remember, each compute node has 128 cores and 256 gigabytes of memory, unless you're on the large memory ones, but we're not doing that here. And I'm going to say I want to use two nodes and I want to run 128 tasks per node. And that's saying I want to run 128 processes or programs on the node. I want to use all the cores at once. Okay. I then specify my partition. And we'll come to see what that, that is. But that really is sort of a configuration of resources and my quality of service, QoS. That we'll see what that is as well. I specify my account. This is the budget my is going to be charged for the job I'm running. Now, if you've only got one um, a, a login account and it's on a single project, you don't really have to specify the account. You'll have a default account and you just get charged for that. But actually, the way people set up large scale projects on a system like Archer 2, they may split up their budgets into sub budgets and then you can charge the separate sub budgets using something like this account string here. And then I also specify how long I want this job to run for. So 10 minutes here. That's hours, minutes, seconds, and I ask for 10 minutes. Um, the thing to be aware of for this time is this is you telling the batch system the maximum amount of time you want this job to run for. Basically, it's saying to the batch system, if my job's not finished after 10 minutes, you can stop it and run something else. So you're asking for a limit here. So this top bit here is specifying the job to a batch system. Okay. And then this bottom bit here now is S run minus N256. Uh, and then this dot forward slash XTHI. This is actually running something for that job. So S run is the command we use to launch our jobs. It's the command we use to take this program here and run 256 copies of it across two compute nodes. Um, and that's what we're going to do here. So that's the name of my application, XTHI. That could be whatever it is. That could be Python. That could be R. That could be other things. We'll see examples here. Here I'm specifying I want this to run on all 256 workers I have access to. Um, and that's, that's what it will do. So this will take a program here and run 256 copies of it on across two compute nodes using all the cores available. If it is a parallel application, then that will start up and you know, this, this will deal with a parallel startup. And I'll get a, a, a one parallel program running using 256 cores. But it equally works exactly the same if this is if you want to run 256 copies of a serial program and maybe they'll each look at different files. They'll be configured in such a way to read in different files of those kind of things. Any questions about that? Now, I, I can also ask for the same amount of resources. So my top part of this batch file here is not changed, but I can use them in different ways when I actually launch things. So here I can run multiple things separately. So here I'm running four lots of this program, each using 64 cores, and they're going to run separately. Uh, and I can do this using this special um, and sign at the end here, which says run this in the background, run them all in the background. And then I put a command here that says wait, which means wait for all of these to finish. They'll all run separately in parallel. And when they've all finished, then the, the overall job will finish as well. Uh, yet, yeah, so there's a question here, can S run be used for serial run? Yes, so so uh, absolutely, you can use S run to run a single uh, program. Um, 
on one core, uh, that's that's perfectly fine as well. Um, we'll we'll come on to to see some more examples of that. So we don't have to just take one application, put it inside a batch script, and then run it on all the resources. We can take a batch script, which is my overall asking for resources, and then run multiple different things in here. And we, we, I wouldn't have to have all these as e, uh, this one application. They could all be different applications run at the same time. Um, uh, and in this example, all four, because I put this and sign at the end of them, all four of these will run simultaneously. And what it will do is it will give the first 64 cores to this application, and then the second 64 cores to this application, the third to this one, and the fourth to this one. That'll use all the 256 cores I have in these two nodes, and they'll all run at the same time. Uh, so I can do that. I can share the cores inside a, inside a node with, well, I can share nodes for different applications running inside the same job. That's definitely possible. I can also do it in a more scripted way here. So here I'm running 256 single core versions of my application um, with uh, exactly the same configuration again, but I just run a batch script here to generate 256 uh, copies of that and, and away it will go. Now, of course, what this application actually does is entirely your responsibility. So I would need some way of this application knowing that it was running um, and have some way of it doing different things depending on what it's doing. But um, that's exactly how you can do it. There's also a, a, a built-in functionality into the scheduler to allow you to do a similar kind of thing, but with a bit more structure around it. And that's called array jobs. So the Slurm scheduler we use does the, has a functionality for array jobs where you can specify, instead of having to manually start your jobs up like this, you can get the system itself to specify them up, to start them up for you. And here we've got an example where I've got, I'm asking for a, a job which is going to be run for four hours. It's going to want one node. It's going to take all the cores on that node. I mean, but that's sort of irrelevant because you get all the cores anyway, because nodes are exclusively used. It's going to give each task it runs, each worker, each, each application, um, one core. And I'm going to create an array of 56 elements. OK, here. And then my S run command down here, I don't have any repeats in here or anything like that. I just give it a single S run command which says just run this executable and it will automatically go away and create 56 versions of it on that same node. Uh, but the nice thing, it, it also gives you this array task ID as well. So each one of these workers can read in from the command line a different number and it knows what, what, what place it is in the array. And then you can use that internally in your program to maybe choose a different file or a different data set or have a different um, seed for your parallel room number generator or something like that and do something different in your programs. So these are all different ways of running multiple things inside a single node or inside a, a bunch of nodes separately. You don't have to take one set of resources and run the same application everywhere. You can do these things separately, either manually or using the, the Slurm array job um, things and it, and it gives you those different uh, indexes. Um, most of the time for people using Archer 2, we don't sort of go through this level of detail for these kind of things because most people doing large scale computational simulation have a have a use case like this. They have one application, they want to give it lots of nodes, they just run it like this. But in data analysis, data science, quite often you have your individual worker isn't doesn't need lots of compute nodes but you, uh, or cores, but you have lots of data sets to get through or you've got lots of analysis to do. And so you may want to run lots of copies of your workers and, and these are ways you do that. Any more questions about that? Now, in these examples here, we're writing a batch script and we're submitting it to a batch system and it will take that and it will run it for us, but it will run it for us when there's resources free. So that might be 
immediately. That might be in an hour, that might be tomorrow. Okay, and you can come back and see when it's run. It is also possible to run interactively. So this is where you get access to a compute node directly um, by using these, these special commands here. And there's different ways of doing it. Um, but here's an example at the top, s run. So instead of, so this is now not writing a batch script. This is just typing from the command line. s run minus, minus nodes equals one. So I'm using one node. I want to have two tasks on that node. Each task will have one core. So I'm taking a whole node, but I'm only going to actually use two cores out of 128. That's what I want to do. I'll, be, I'll get charged for the whole node in my budget, but I'm only using two cores. But again, that's my resources. I want to do that. Here we're using a slightly different quality of service and a reservation here. So this is a short QoS and a, and a reservation. We've not seen that before, but basically we have something like 32 nodes set aside on Archer 2 for people to run quick jobs on to do debugging and, and development work through this short queue. And here I'm saying I want to run for 20 minutes uh, and just run this Python code for me. So run it directly. Don't put it inside a batch script. Run it directly. Give me the results straight to my screen. And that will work fine. You may have to wait a little bit of time before we start. So if there's not any of those, um, if there's not any of the, those uh, nodes available, but once they're available, it'll start up and run for you. You can also do exactly the same thing, but actually log directly into a node. And uh, so instead of running, in this case, Python, I'm running something called a bash with this PTY flag. And that will actually give me a script on the node where I can manually run commands myself. And that can be useful as well. It's not how you would normally run your large jobs because you need to be logged in. You need to wait for the thing to happen. Uh, but it is useful if or something's not quite working right here. I need to go and check this by hand, what's going on, rather than having to wait for your job going through the batch queue each time. You can you can create a, a login directly to a compute node and run on there. Um, you can also, Slurm lets you do other things as well. So you can also do this thing where you allocate nodes. So you can ask for a bunch of nodes. And then when they're allocated, you can then run uh, jobs against them. And that's an alternative way of doing it. So this will also, so this S run at the top, the first two S runs, they do an allocate and a run at the same time, but you can separate those out and you can allocate and then run later. We've not been through the block block here. Um, I will talk about it in a little bit. The best distribution here is a, is a way of specifying how you want to use, how you want to distribute your work across the cores on a node. So if you want to go use the first core and the second core and the third core and the fourth core, or do you want to use the first core on the first node and then the first core on the second node and the first core on the first, or the second core on the first node. So you can control how you spread your work around across the across the hardware you've been given access to. Uh, that can be important, may not be or not, but we'll, we'll look at that. There's a lot more detail on this on the website, but basically these are the queues that we have set up on Archer 2. And they're not called queues for, for Slurm, they're called partitions and quality of service. Um, Okay, there's a question here. How does, let's, let me go back a second. How does uh, CPUs per task differ from tasks per node? Um, so CPUs per task is how many processing cores you want to give to each of your workers, right? So if I've got 128 cores on a node and 128 workers, I'm going to give them each one core. I'm going to give them CPUs per task is one. Each each worker I run, each program that I run has one core to run on. And I want to run 128 tasks workers on that node. So that would be 120 tasks per node is 128. That's the number of things I want to run. In this example at the bottom here, uh, oh, sorry, let's take this example at the top here. My task is Python. That's my worker. 
and I'm going to say I want to run two version, two copies of Python on that compute node. And each copy of Python is going to get one CPU core to use. OK, now um, I can change those. So instead of saying I want to run two tasks, I could say I want to run 64 tasks on a node. That will give me 64 copies of Python on the node, each potentially doing different things. And then I could say I could still say one CPUs per task. So I'd be using 64 cores on the node and the other 64 cores would be empty doing nothing. If I said CPUs per task equals two, then I would give out two cores per worker. Each Python would have two cores it could use. And um, I would be using a whole 128, but only with 64 programs. Uh, now, for a lot of things, um, it may not make sense to give them more than one core per worker, but it can be useful, partly because you can sometimes create additional workers from your program. So you can do things like create threads from a program and that can use extra cores to do more work. And partly because it lets you spread out across the hardware. And if you spread out across the hardware, you can maybe get better performance. And we'll, we'll look at that. But that, that's the difference between CPUs per task and tasks per node. If we look at just briefly, you don't need to take this in. This, there will be no test, don't worry. Um, but uh, this is specifying how we set up Slurm on the system and the different ways you can use it. So most people run their jobs on the standard QoS and the standard partition. So if we go back and look at our S run commands here, we're specifying a partition and a QoS. Um, if we look here, in our batch scripts, we're specifying a partition and a QoS. And standard standard means you can run jobs that go up to 24 hours. You can run jobs which can use up to 1,000 nodes, 1,024 nodes. And you can have 16 jobs running at any one time and 64 jobs in the queue, including the 16 that's running. So that's the limits that are on that. But there are other, uh, are other configurations. So the large scale QoS with the standard partition will let you run up jobs that can use up to five, the whole system, 5,860 nodes. But you can only run those jobs for up to 12 uh, hours. You can only have one of those jobs running at any one time and, and at most eight in the queue, including anyone that's running. And your smallest job must be over 1024 uh, nodes so basically if you if this is a way of us splitting up the system in such a way that you know we can't we no one user can use all the nodes for for 50 days because that would lock everybody else out so there's, there's those configurations and then there's other queues we can use to the high if you do if you really wanted those high memory nodes if you want to guarantee you get to use those high memory nodes which have doubled the amount of uh, memory in them, you can use the high mem, high mem, QoS and partition, and it has its own limits. Um, there's a low priority queue, which doesn't charge your budget, it's effectively for free, um, but there are limits on that as well. So you, you can, uh, you know, 24 hours and, and, and those kind of things. You can also run longer jobs than 24 hours, so up to 96 hours, but only for a smaller part of a system. So 64 nodes um, as a maximum uh, node per job. Um, that's that kind of thing. Uh, now, the reason we have these limits in place, I mean, you may say, okay, my job takes two weeks to run. How's that? That's not gonna be, it's gonna be no use for me. What, what What's going on here? Well, people are encouraged to write their applications in such a way that they can be stopped and started. So what we call checkpointing so an application will run, gets to the end of its time limit, it, it, it writes some data out, it stops, and then it can restart again. And this just means we can share the system more fairly. If you've got applications where it's very hard to do that, then of course you can run on the longer queues, or it is possible to do what's called a reservation and ask for a dedicated set of nodes for a longer period of time. It costs a bit more from a budget, but you can do that. 
Um, any questions on the queuing side? I appreciate until we actually go into this and, and play um, yeah, play for real on the system, it's all a bit abstract. Um, but hopefully it will become clear when we actually get hands on the system and start, start running things. Okay, so just to come back to this, this idea of tasks per node and, and CPUs per task and, and what we call placement and binding, um, we need to look back again at the hardware in an Archer 2 node and, and, and that can impact performance. So as I said, inside a node we have 100, 128 cores. And any core, any one core, so we took this core here, top left, can use all the memory, the memory of these pink salmon attached rectangles. So any one core can use all the memory. So I can have one core and it can use the 256 gigabytes that are available. It's probably slightly under 256 gigabytes once you take operating system into account. But yes, it can go up to that. However, physically, it's connected like this. So that each processor has these groups of 16 cores in a, in, a, in a group and each group of 16 cores has some memory attached to it and so each one of those has say 32 gigabytes attached to it and then each processor is connected together by a high performance connection interconnection um, and then each processor has a network connection attached to it why do you care about this if one core can use all the memory uh, from a functionality point of view, you don't, okay? It's just actually at the hardware level, there are different costs, different performance associated with some of these different boxes that we see here. So modern processors, because of this hierarchy of how things are physically connected, are what we call non-uniform memory access. So they have a performance where it's faster for a core to talk to some of its local memory, which is directly attached to it, than it is for that core to use some of the memory attached to one of the other groups on its processor, and than it is for that core to go across this interconnect and talk to some memory on a different, uh, on the other processor in the same node. Okay. And so that means we have these non-uniform memory costs. If this core wants to use memory, it's faster using its own local memory than it is using the memory on another group on its on its uh, processor or using memory attached to the other processor in the node. Now, if we have one core and needs all 256 gigabytes of memory, well then tough, you just have to deal with this performance cost that some of the memory is slower to access than others to it. But if you are, for instance, actually just running 64 workers on a node each worker needs a gigabyte of memory but they 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 don't need all the memory then what you want to avoid doing in that scenario is actually getting all our cores on the first processor um so sorry let me say let me take a, a slightly different example i've got 64 cores together they all want to use the 256 gigabytes of memory so they each need four gigabytes of memory Remember, I've only got 128 gigabytes on this processor on the left, and I've got 128 on the right. What I want to avoid in that situation is putting all 64 workers on the first processor. Now, it will work if I do that, but they'll, they'll have access to their fast memory, but they'll also have to go across to the other processor to get access to the slower memory over there, and that will slow down overall the workers' activities. If actually I spread out my workers, so I had 32 on the first processor and 32 on the second processor, then they each get access to four gigabytes of memory, which is connected locally to them. They have each access to the fastest memory available to them. And I don't have this problem of, of slow, slow memory accesses by going across uh, different connections inside the processor. And this is what we mean by placement and binding or, or uh, uh, because and this is why we have these tasks per node and cpus per task parameters because it let us specify these kind of things so for this example here 
if I'm using all the cores on a node, then it doesn't matter, right? I'm using all the cores on a node. I can spread everything out. They'll use all the cores. It doesn't really matter to me what order that happens in. However, if I'm only using 128 cores across two nodes, so 64 cores per node, then I probably want to specify this CPUs per task equals two here, spread out my workers, use all the processors, get access to all the fast memory directly, and that will probably give us better performance uh, doing that. Um, uh, and you can do more complicated things than that. So there are functions which will let you do generate mask IDs to to give out to your sub 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 jobs that if you're doing sort of array jobs or smaller tasks and those kind of things it's possible to do more complicated things than that so if you need to generate custom placements because you're not going to evenly give out two workers to every two cores to every worker or something like that but it's also possible to do that using functionality like this again you don't need to worry about this particularly but it, it will it, there are we have uh, mechanisms to do that as well you can also, I've not really talked about it, but you can also specify memory constraints as well. So you can, instead of giving out things by number of cores, you can give out amounts of memory and that will split up across the, the system as well. Again, it's a little, uh, I appreciate it's all a bit esoteric at the moment, but just remember, it looks, you know, theoretically we have 128 workers, cores available per node and 256 gigabytes. But in reality, there's a bit more detail in the hardware, which means we may care if we're not going to use all the workers on the node, we may care about spreading our workers out and getting access to the networks and the memory in an efficient manner. Okay. If you're going to fill up your nodes, if you fill up all your nodes, then it, this, this doesn't matter at all and you can ignore it. But if at any point you're going to underpopulate and use less workers than there are cores per node, we probably want to do that in a sensible manner. You may ask, why do I want to? Why would I want to underpopulate and use less workers than there are cores? But quite often that's because actually each worker needs more memory than you could get if you could if you filled up all the workers on the node. So you can often underpopulate, use less workers per node and get access to more memory per worker. OK, um, the other place where we can tune our performance is on the file system. On the file system, it's a parallel file system. We use in Lustre here. It, it's configured in such a way that we use Yes, there's a good question here. So let me go back a slide, a couple of slides. So if it's not clear, this is a compute node here, single node. We've got 5,860 nodes on Arch 2. Each node looks like this. In a node, there are 128 cores. Cores are the things that run our programs. Okay. Each one of those is actually implemented. So that 128 cores is actually two 64 core processors in a node. So a node has actually got two lots of 64 cores put in the node. And then they work together. And so you can use them all as 128 workers. But physically, they are two processors, each with 64 cores. Each processor has 128 gigabytes of memory attached. Put it all together, we have 256 gigabytes of memory and 128 workers. But physically, they're actually structured like this. Two processors. Each processor has 64 cores. Those cores are the things that will run our programs. Does that make sense? Good. As I say, I won't be clear on everything, all my descriptions. So if things don't make sense, do just let me know. Um, OK, so we have where we've got these file systems as well. And what we use here on Arch 2 is called Lustre. It's a parallel file system. Uh, you don't really care on this configuration on the right. I mean, it's set up in a particular way. What we do care about is it's, it, it, it distributes data across the file system to try and give you high performance. So we've got nine, you know, nearly 6,000 nodes. 
but we don't have that many file storage nodes. So the file system hasn't got 6,000 nodes in it as well. There's a smaller number of servers which store the data. Um, and so to be able to get access and high performance from our compute nodes, we want to be able to use as many of these storage nodes as possible. The way Lustre does that is something called striping. So basically any file you create, it can split up across all the storage it has access to, to give you parallel access to the, to the file you have. So you can stripe your data across, across workers. And if you're using, if you're running a one large parallel application and it's accessing one big file and all your workers are talking to that file, that's useful for you because you want to be able to spread out your workers IO, so reading and writing of a file um, and get access to all those resources. Um, however, not all scenarios are like that. So say you had actually an application, you, you were going to run a thousand workers, each run each running their own serial application, each doing their own separate thing, and they're all going to access separate files. So they all have one file each or 10 files each, but no one's sharing a file. Then you wouldn't want to split up your files across the workers because splitting up the files across the, of the file system or striping actually has some costs associated with it. There's some metadata costs, there's some cost of, of working out where your data is, what, what worker you should go and speak to and, and those kind of things. This is all done for you automatically by the file system, uh, but there is a cost associated with that. So that means we have a file system where we have different ways of using it, which can give us good performance for different kinds of uh, application. Um, a large scale parallel application where all the workers are accessing the same file at once may want to stripe, split up its file across lots of file system workers. And um, applications where there's lots of separate files and no one's sharing them don't want to do that striping. Okay. So in Lustre on an Archer 2, we have a default, which is that we don't stripe files. So by default, stri files are not distributed across the file system. They exist only on one storage server, on one storage target. And that's good for, as I say, this individual access mode, but not so for a parallel one. Um, but you have the a, a possibility to change that, right? So if you have a, if you're doing data science on Arch2 and you've got a million files, they're each going to be processed separately, then the default setup is what you want. There's no striping. Each file is on its is on a single server um, uh, and each worker will be able to access it as they need to. Um, you can find, you, but you can also change the stripe. So if I was running a large parallel application with parallel IO, I would probably want to set my stripe in and use all the surfers. And I can use that, do that using these commands here. So on the work file system, this is not the home one, but the work file system, I can use this LFS command to have a look at the file system and, and see what, uh, and configure how a directory, and then any files that are created in that directory are distributed across that file system. Okay, so striping can improve bandwidth and um, overall performance, but only if you're trying to access your files in parallel. Now, I should just give you a, a, a little, let me just set up a screen here. One second. Just change my settings so you can see it better. Okay, so let me share the screen just to give you a little flavor for this. Okay, so this is my terminal. This is my uh, SSH window on Archer 2. Uh, this is ver therefore on the login nodes. And you can see that here, this is LN2. So my name is Adrian, my username is Adrian J, Adrian Jackson, but it's one I've chosen here. And I'm on login node 2. 
And you can see I'm on the work file system. This account is in a project called Z19, uh, Z19, and then that's my uh, directory. Actually, when I first log into the system, it will look like this. So I'm on here, tilde means home, my home directory. And you'll see that's home Z19, Z19 agent. Now, if you remember, this home file system is backed up, um, but it's not accessible from the work file system. So I immediately, I'm going to go across to my work file system. Now, when you do this from your project account, that will be more like Z T144, T144, and then whatever username you chose um, there. Um, this is the work file system. Um, actually, I could show you. Uh, this is an example of um, that interactive run that I was talking to you about before. So I can submit a job interactively. Um, and this is all sorts of stuff going on in here. Um, we don't need to care about, but it means a sort of default. Basically, this just means distribute data distribute workers across the node sensibly. Anyway, I've asked for one node, I've asked for eight tasks per node, one CPU per task, one core per task. I've run it on this short queue, so it starts immediately. Um, and you can see now I'm logged in, and now I'm no longer on login two, I'm actually on NID 001001. Looks a bit like binary, but actually that's just node 1001 in the system. Um, uh, but I, I'm, I'm still in exactly the same directory and all those kind of things and then I can I could run things directly from here uh, in terms of that uh, let me make a directory uh, in terms of that file system if I look at what that directory is here so you'll see I've got I created a directory in my work file system it's got a stripe of one stripe size of a megabyte a stripe pattern of zero and a stripe offset of one. You don't care about these, but basically it just says anything in that directory will not be split up and distributed. But I can also um, change that by specifying I want to stripe my files that are created in there across lots of workers. Um, so I, I could do it like this, but let, let me first create a file in that directory. I've created a file there. And then if I have a look at that directory again, we can see my directory is still the same. And I've got one file in there. It's not striped. And I can actually see it will tell me where exactly it's stored on the system. Not that you care about that, but it will tell me some details about that. I can also change the stripe of that directory to say, actually, now, um, specify a stripe of minus one, which means use all the file system servers you can. It hasn't actually changed this file here. It's not striped that because that already existed. But if I created a new file, and then have a look at that, you can see that my directory is still the same, this file is still the same, but my new file I created has actually been striped across 12 file system servers um, like this. OK, so that's sort of just giving you a practical feel for how we how we can play around with a file system for optimization as well. Now, most of the time, I don't imagine you your use cases, not that I know them, but um, most of the time, your use cases probably wouldn't need to um, to play too much of a file system. But just remember, depending on what your requirements are, there may be some performance benefits you can get by changing the file system here. So sorry, someone asked me to increase my font. I've changed the size again. Let me know if that's big enough this time. So the, yeah, good, that's good. So all this is really saying, there are ways you can configure the file system for different file access patterns. Once you know what you want to run on Archer 2, have a little think and think, 
is, is am I running in such a way that all my workers are accessing files individually and there's no sharing between them? In that case, what I do uh, as default, what the system does as default is good for me, or am I running something where I'm getting workers accessing the same file at the same time? If that's the case, I may need to look at the striping and, and what I do there. Well, so I'm just on the system. I should also show you um, something, things you'll be doing um, yourself at some point. But um, if I say, all our software on the system we use through this module system. Uh, so that what is what loads and, and unloads packages that are pre-installed. Um, and just to give you a flavor here, I've got the, when I first log in, the, the Cray programming environment is set up with the Cray compilers, um, so, but I can change that. So if I did a module load, uh, the GNU programming environment, um, then I can change those kind of things. So that's how we interact with the soft, software environment of the system. Um, if you're interested, uh, you can type module avail and it will tell you all the different things that are already installed um, on the system that you can use. Most of these are, are large scale computational simulation applications. If you're doing data science, it's maybe not as in interesting for you, um, but there are things in there like the Cray installs of libraries that are often used for storing data, HDF5 and NetZDF. Then we'll also see this Cray Python, we'll come to see that, and um, this Cray R, um, and, and other things like that already installed on the system for you as well. Okay, I'll stop sharing this for now unless there are any questions about that. And I will go to back to the slides where we just about finished. Um, way over time but that's okay and let's see we can catch up we can catch up okay so the basic hardware running basic jobs is pretty straightforward in Archer 2 but if you start into distributing jobs or if you're underpopulating nodes then it's worth understanding how the hardware works all the hardware underlying hardware looks like so you can um efficiently use those kind of things. You can run lots of, you can run jobs in lots of different ways on Archer 2, uh, but it's possible to combine lots of small jobs into one big job using some of the array jobs or the manual approach that we've, we've done that kind of thing there. And then you can tune your, you know, mapping of your workers to the available resources to give you good performance, either by playing with the placement and binding, which we've shown on specifying things like number of CPUs per task and things like that, and by playing with the file system setup to, to improve your performance overall. Um, as I say, most of it is probably reasonably abstract at this point, but we'll now go and run some small examples to see what that looks like in practice. Any questions? Okay, so um uh, let me share a couple of things with you then so so what i uh the next thing we want to be able to do is uh go on to practical the first practical exercise so where is my screen if I stop sharing that. Okay, so if we go here, you can see that we're on, um, we're on a break at the moment. Uh, we're gonna go into the, the sort of uh, beginning exercises, but, um, if we go to the course materials for here, so this GitHub page, and then we go into exercises, we'll see there's five practical sheets here, one, two, three, four, five. Um, 
there's a first one here is sort of getting to know actually too. So it's just getting onto the system and playing around, just running a couple of small jobs um, to check some of the things we've talked about here. So memory performance, process placement, um, just getting onto the system. So what I would suggest you do um, is we we go off and we we try that uh, as well. There's also a second exercise which we we don't have to do, uh, but it's there for you to play around with if the I/O thing is of, of interest to you, which is to run some benchmarks on the I/O system and play on the file system and play around with that striping to see how that impacts performance as well. Um, but if 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 it's, it's if it's unlikely that you're going to be doing large parallel uh, applications, then you can ignore that kind of thing for now. So what I would suggest you do is, is uh, I'm going to uh, demonstrate this now here, is you log into Arch2, you try to get on the system with your account. Uh, if you have any problems with that, let me know. And then what we'll do is we'll clone this repository onto Arch2 to give us access to some of the exercises directly. So I have now um, created a uh, I, account in the same project that you're using um, so let me let me demonstrate so this is a good question have we cloned into cloned into work or home so this is now my account in the 144 project which is a project set up for this training course hopefully you should be able to see that as well um, and all I'm going to do is clone into the work file system okay so Actually, when I first logged in, it was like this. So I went CD work 144, TA 144. Um, I can see there's lots of different accounts in here. My is called TA 144AG. You don't have to call it like that, but that's what it's called. Um, and then if I run the git clone command here, uh, I will clone directly that repository into um my work file system here and if i then go into that work file system into exercises we're in a place where we have all the uh, practical sessions now for the first practical we don't actually need um we don't actually need any of that stuff um there but it's useful for the later practicals with the first practical we can just use things that are already um installed and just write batch scripts to do that kind of stuff uh, well that's not actually quite true actually the last the last part of the first practical will use this um, binding directory here um, and we'll we'll work on this but it should all be detailed in the uh, exercise sheet for you so if there was a question let me have a look a couple of questions okay thanks Yevgeny so Yevgeny uh, I should have introduced us here to as a to uh, help with any issues anybody has running um, running things on the system as well. Um, so welcome, Yevgeny. Um, right. So I think the thing to do is go have a look at exercise one, practical one. Work through the sheet. Try and log onto the system. Try and run your first job. See if you can answer the questions with. Uh, you know what what performance you get with uh, the different or uh, what placement you get and then what memory performance you get with the different configurations of running things okay and we'll see how you get on um, over the next 10 15 minutes then what we'll do is we'll have a a, a break um which takes it up to 12 um, and then i'll talk through a lecture at 12 till about half 12 on containers um, and then after that we will do a the practical on containers up to lunch time so for the next 10 minutes um, play around with practical one see how you get on if that all works well you can go straight into practical two and play around with that as well and then you can have a break until until um, 12 and then we'll come back for the next lecture at 12 and at any point in any that you have any questions uh, or you struggle to get onto arch2 or anything like that then drop us a message in the chat you can send private messages or you can send directly 
uh, just the, the group chat or you can also send me an email i'll stick my email back in the chat as well uh, so that's it's useful okay any questions before we get going So try it out. We'll be here. Let us know how you get on. Just, uh, just for a bit of clarity, I wasn't entirely clear when I was saying this, um, about the. Um, some of the parameters in the batch file. So um, if I just go, just give you an example. Uh, let me create a batch script. Let me just copy and paste some stuff into here. Although copy and paste doesn't always work very well, does it? Give me one second. There we go. Let's just tidy this nonsense up. So if it's, if it's not been 100% clear for you, we're specifying things at the top, which um, so you can ignore this thing at the moment here, this open MP num threads, uh, OMP num threads um, that can control the number of workers something can produce if they're using something called open MP to do this. Um, Yes, the blue is not readable. Uh, let me <laughs> let me change my uh, colours. Give me a second. So I remember the VI way of being able to change colours. Any better? I can I can make it even. Let me just try slate instead. I don't, know if I don't know if it's worse or better. It's like being at the opticians. This. Okay, let's try that. Hideous, but let's try that from the color screen. Okay, um, so what we have here, just as a quick recap, the top part is telling the batch system how I want my nodes, what, what resources I want at the top. Um, and um, yeah, I know, I know, I'll get there. Um, the problem that I, what we're telling at the top is what we want the resources to be. And then this line at the bottom here 
DFS run that actually runs our job. Okay, so at the top I've asked for one node. I'm saying I want to run 128 workers per node, and I'm going to give each one of those workers one task. And then this S run down here will pick up that and say I'm going to write I'm going to run 128 tasks here. Okay, so if I wanted to then run 16 it only run 64 MPI processes or tasks here, then I could go up here and change this 64, 128 to 64, and that would change it to this S run down here, would only run 64 things. If I change that to 32, it's only going to run 32 things. So at a bulk level, that will let you change the number of processes MPI run will use. Uh, no, sorry, the number of processes S run will start up, which will give us the number of MPI processes we have. OK, uh, there are other ways of doing it. So I could leave that 128 at the top, use all the cores in the node. And then down here, I could specify minus N. And I could say 64 there. So I can also specify at this S run level the number of workers I want to create. So I can do it there as well. So you could leave that alone and then do the change down here. And every time you submit it, you change it there. And that will change the number of workers you're getting. Is that clearer? Uh, in terms of OMP num threads, a task is a worker, a task is a worker, is an MPI process. If they're all the same words for the same thing. Um, in terms of the open MP num threads question here, is it the same as CPUs per task? This is exactly the, the correct because OpenMP threads are little workers that your 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 main workers can create. You can think about them as little helpers. And so, if my main program is going to create, I'm going to have 16 copies of my main program, and then each one of them is going to create one worker. Then I only need one task per worker, uh, one CPU per task. If I had created a, a program which could create two workers per two OpenMP threads per worker, then I'd want to give it two physical cores per uh, overall worker so it could create its own mini workers here and use that up there. So I have a relationship between this and this number here, because if I'm creating these mini workers, I want to give them some resources to run on. Otherwise, I may not get good performance out of them. That's another good question. Um, so by default, when I run a job, we'll get a slurm output. Um, so let me let me let me run my job here as an example, and you can see what comes out. Um, so if I uh, is that going to work for me? If I go s batch my script, uh, this is the problem of cutting and pasting things or copying things. I think there's going to be some random character in here that's come from the PDF and it doesn't like. Uh, so let's just see if I can fix that. I might have to type this all out by hand, but Bear with me, I'll get there. The joys of live demonstrations.
OK, I submit my job here. I can actually check if it's running. If I do an SQ and then I do my username, because if actually if I do SQ, um, it will tell me if I type SQ, it will actually show me all the jobs that are running on the system. There's a lot in there. Um, if I do SQ and my username, it will show you my jobs. And I've got nothing running, so mine should have finished. And you'll see by default, it's created a file called slurm dash and then this number. And when we submitted, uh, the eagle eyes amongst you, you'll see that was the number I was given when I submit my job. So that's the name of my number and a dot out. So any output your file, your program creates by default will go into this file. So if I do a, have a look at this file, you can see that it's created some output in here. OK, uh, let me just see. It sounds like there's some more questions coming in. Um, yeah, so there's an OK, yeah, that, that's OK. Um, I should have given you more detail on that, but, but, but yeah. But, so if I submit another job, you can see there's the number there. If I do that SQ thing again, hopefully we'll catch it whilst it's running. I've done an SQ and it look, it's there, it's running. That's the name of my job. It's running a standard partition. There's my username. That's how long it's been running for, three seconds. That's the actual compute node it's running on. If I have a look again, it's disappeared. Um, so that means it's finished. Um, and I've got another output here. Um, it is possible when I write my batch scripts to change the output so we can do things like uh, and I'm going to get the syntax wrong when I do this um, so bear with me it's going to complain at me I'll, I'll, I'll describe what I am if you actually want to see what all these commands do, you can type man and s and the name, so man s batch will give me my manual page for s batch. And I'm going to have a look through here to see what my as it combined. Let me do this manually then. Can't remember off the top of my head, but let's go. Don't, don't worry, this is all magic at the moment. If it works, I'll let you know what it what it actually means. Yeah, okay, it doesn't like that. As I say, I don't keep all this in my head at any one time, so let's just check. It's pending, so now I've got my job running. It says it's pending. PD means it's waiting to run. It's sitting in the queue. Now it's finished. And now you can see actually I've created two files. So I've created an output file and an error file, uh, and I created it with the number of the job that ran. So you can see when our job was submitted, it was given this number, 5,811,019. That's, that's just the ID that's assigned to a job. You can see that means we've run nearly 6 million jobs on the Archer 2 since we started running. But I actually modified my submission script to say put the output from a file, so any output it produces in a file called xthi dot this uh, percentage A means burst the batch job number dot it out and put the error, any error that's produced in a different file there. So I can do that as well. By default, if I don't do anything like that, it'll just produce all, it'll put all the, the output together in a slurm file, slurm dot dash the name the number of a job dot out okay but that's all doing exactly the same thing um, i can produce my output like that you know if you there are other commands you can do as well so there's the sq command um there's the s batch command which runs the job you can also use an s cancel command and give it a number um which would cancel a job that's either running or queued if you if you'd submit a job and we're actually I don't want to run that now then yes can come on there's also quite a like a nice one I like called s info uh, it doesn't show up very well because I've got my screen zoomed in a bit but it tells you all the hardware in the system so it tells you what we're doing so there's 513 nodes waiting for a future job and there's six nodes have been drained, 79 nodes reserved, 
there's 5,216 nodes currently allocated to other jobs. Um, and, and then you can see some other things in here as well. So actually you can see there's about 22 nodes doing nothing at the moment, but that's the, the rest are all busy. Um, we also actually have some, a small number of GPU no nodes in the system, only a very small number of GPU nodes, um, AMD GPUs, if anybody's interested. And then just to wrap that bit up, we can just see if I have a look at my output here, I ran this program called XTH High, which is a little helper thing, which just says, where did something run? Um, and it just tells me where the nodes and the, and the task affinity that things were, were run on. Um, and this lets me see if, so here I'm running 16 workers. They each have separate ranks, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 15. Each worker has two helpers, threads. And then this tells me what they're, they're assigned to. Um, at the moment, we can see that they're a bit spread out. So if I do this, uh, is, it, is it the right syntax? No, it's not the right syntax. Uh, again, I don't have it in my head right away let me just pull that out from the lecture notes um, distribution isn't it distribution equals book. So you could see there, actually, obviously I did that on purpose, so you could see some error output. But the error that went wrong went into a different file to the, the output, obviously. Um, let me have a look here. Um, and so that, there I'm specifying my 16. Um, if I took that 16 away, and, and let the um, batch system just use the S run, just use what's in the back system. Uh, it's going to, you're going to see we're going to be running up to 64 things at once. Um, and I can also put in this other thing as well, which is just hint no multi threading. Um, and now you can see here that we have a, uh, it is changed exactly how it's assigned things to the worker. So this is, uh, this is what's going on here. Um, so we can play around with those kind of assignments. Um, there's more, there's a lot more detail in exactly the, the things we can specify in our script. For, as I say, for most on the documentation on the on the H2 website, and we can go into a bit more detail if anybody's interested. Most of what we do, and if we're filling up the nodes, it really doesn't matter. But we can see that you can have an impact where, um, in my first uh, configurations, actually, the the way it's set up, uh, the processes and the workers can actually spread out across large amounts of the, the, the CPU, so they're not really restricted in in, in this uh, instance. They're not really restricted to any particular cause. But if I change what I'm actually doing, um, I can make them only. So this affinity thing at the end may means what physical cause or what um, logical cause do you have access to, and so I can restrict them right down to working on only um individual uh, calls as well so there is a lot of scope there for playing around with exactly how you match your program to the hardware okay uh, in the um interest of not getting too far behind on the lectures um i'll start in the next lecture but does anybody have any questions about that before we get going
Right, okay, let me stop sharing and start sharing a different screen again. Okay, so we've seen the hardware a little bit. We've had some detail about about how you run things in basics. I, I appreciate there's a lot more in-depth detail we could go into, but in the first instance, it says you've had a hopefully a little flavor and a feel for the system. Now, the next thing I'm gonna look at is, okay, this is, again, this is not where we would start off with, with most user communities coming onto Archer 2 where they may have a large scale application and be uh, used to running on parallel systems. In the data science arena, we tend to be a bit more, we've got um, varied applications. They may not all be parallel. They may not all be, um, have been installed or tried on systems like Archer 2 before. Um, and so what we're looking at here is uh, what's the software route if you've got something that's problematic to port across to the system or it has some custom dependencies it, it needs certain kinds of operating systems or those kind of things as we've already seen with a little bit of detail we've all there's a lot of in software already installed uh, and there's optimized versions of python and r available um, you can see here that we've got a create python version which has got 3.9 uh, of R of Python and 4.2 of R, um, and the the optimized part of this really is it means it, it includes uh, num numerical library stuff which is is installed and um, uses the Cray uh, maths libraries efficiently. So NumPy, SciPy, MPI, 4Py, and Dask are all sort of installed and should work well. Obviously, a lot of people, when they come to things like Python, need specific versions. So 3.9 might not be good enough. You know, need 3.10 or 3.11 or something like that. So uh, you may have to end up installing your own or bringing your own Python across. Likewise, with R. Actually, if we have a look on the system later, there are not there is other versions of Python available, but um, not many. And there may be scenarios where you need to bring your own, rule your own Python, as it were. Um, uh, so the challenges for uh, Archer, uh, systems like Archer 2 is whilst Cray Linux and the Linux we're using on this system is a lot better than it used to be, it's not an, a, a vanilla Linux, it's not Ubuntu, it's not uh, you know, Red Hat. Um, and it, it tends to be a bit of a cut down version of Linux, so it doesn't have all the dependencies you, your application may need. And that's where containers comes in, that's where we can bring our own versions of our software across and build on top of the operating system that we have here to provide something that works. The other challenge we have is this fancy file system setup we have where our home directory is not available on the compute nodes. And that means we can't just install software as we would normally in our home directory uh, and use it because that won't work. And so there's ways around both of these, uh, but we just need to know what they are. As we've already had a look, you can see what uh, scientific libraries are available for the module system. So module, the main one that Cray provides is this libsci, Cray libsci, which gives you optimized blas, laypack, scalapack, with lots of introductory material and, and, and man pages on those there. But there are also lots of other maths libraries around. Now, again, this may not be your main focus if you're doing data science, but, uh, but a lot of computational simulation are based off these maths libraries. We have the compilers available. So the Cray, GNU, and AMD compilers. Um, actually, Archer 2 runs in a slightly different scheme where compilers, you still use the same name everywhere, right? So you don't use GCC or GFortran or G++. You use CC for the C compiler, capital C, capital C for the C++ compiler, and FTN for the Fortran compiler. And then these special modules 
when you load them up, they they set up these uh, names to call the correct compilers. Now, again, I don't think most of you are in, in that sort of um, space where you are going to be wanting to use those kind of compilers. Uh, but if you are, uh, let me just show you uh, just to make that more concrete exactly what that looks like in real life. Uh, so again, here I am on this project account here, and I showed you before um, that we can have different compile, uh, different programming environment modules installed. So if I type CC and do that there, that says the CC command calls GCC version 11.2. Okay, and we can see that I've got a GC, GNU program environment installed, and that has loaded up GCC 11.2. If I do the CC command and do this, you can see it's calling the same thing. And if I do the FTN, not that most of you be doing Fortran, um, I can also do that version there. So they're all calling. Uh, now, if I then change, they're all calling those, those compilers in the hood. If I then did a module load prog and create instead, you see it'll go off and it'll say, I'm replacing GCC module with the Cray module. I'm replacing this module with that module. And now if I do CC-V, you can say here, OK, the C compiler is now using the Cray uh, compiler here. So it's using a Cray Clang version 15. And the Fortran compiler is using, um, let me see. There, Cray Fortran version 15. So that's how we use compilers on, on Archer 2. Uh, that's the easy way of using compilers. Um, different compilers are, will give you a different performance at some level. So some compilers are better at producing optimized um, binaries, and some compilers are more um, picky about the language standards they implement. So, these things are converging a little bit over time, but it used to be that the, the GCC compiler suite, GNU, um, C, C++, and Fortran, was very good at compiling a wide range of applications. It would let a lot of code go through, even if that code wasn't quite language uh, compliant, but didn't necessarily have the full optimization functionality that other compilers like the Cray one had. So you could more easily compile your code, but you wouldn't get the extreme performance out of it. And that's why you use compilers like the Cray one or the AMD one, because they're optimized for particular hardware. Well, over time, it's the, the, the differences are going away a bit, but it still tends to be that Cray compiler tends to be a bit picky about language standards um, and, and what it will implement and tends to give you a bit more of an optimized binary that's produced at the end. Does that answer your question? So if you are doing that kind of thing, then the compilers are available. And there are usually a couple of versions of the compilers kicking around. If we get onto more things like Python and R, um, then Python is pretty standard. You can install your own things. You can use a pip install. You can use an anaconda. You can build Python environments on Archer 2, like you can do in most places. Most things will install. Um, OK, but you, excuse me, you have to make sure you, you set it up in the right way. So the particular way we want to do this on Arch2 is load the Cray Python, if we can, if we can get away with using that version, 3.9, or um, I think, let me just check what's the other, uh, you know, let me just check what's available uh, and the Cray Python at the moment. I think it's usually got two different versions. So at the moment, it's 3.9, and it is, nope, there's only one version, 3.9.13. So if you can get away with using that version, then that's the thing to do. And then we use this command here, export Python user base equals, um, and then you specify a directory. Okay, now it doesn't have to be dot .local. It doesn't have to be this exact directory, but you want to specify a directory in your work directory 
where if you go and install new stuff, that's where it lives. So when you want to run things, um, you can get access to them on the on the actual system, on the actual compute nodes. Uh, and, and then you can also then specify this next command, which is export py path equals Python user base slash bin dollar path, which basically just says, give me access to any of the executables that have been installed when you installed stuff there. Okay. Um, and then, uh, then we can install things using pip or, or other Python installs as well. Um, on that on that place we can also use virtual environments so you can activate create and activate virtual environments as long as you set up this python user base it'll install those virtual environments on your work file system um, and and that was it's also often possible that when you're doing local installs it, it won't find a pre-compiled python wheel or similar so you have to set up a compiler as well. So you can run these commands, export cc equals cc, export cxx equals cc, those kind of things. Um, and that will let the Python installs um, complete as well. So if you're trying to install new packages using pip or using Anaconda and you're having problems, you need to make sure your Python user base is set up. You may need to export the compilers like this as well. Same on R. Okay, so on R, we the, the, it's not Python user base, it's R libs user. And then you specify you where you want to install that. So here you can see I've specified that for my Z19 account. Um, and then when you run R, it should install things in that directory. Um, R, R is a little bit more uh, controlled in it, what it wants to do. So you may have to create an install environment first to specify these compiler flags again uh, the way you do that is you do you make a directory called dot r in your home file system because that's where it's going to look for and it doesn't matter if this directory is on your home file system because it's only used on installs not on running things and then in there you can create a file called make vars which, which is specifies make variables used in building things and then you put those three lines in it c equals cc cxx equals cc FC equals FTN, the, the capitalization does matter. And then when we have that, you should then be able to install things correctly using uh, the standard way of installing things in R, either internally in the interpreter and, and, and call install.packages or run it externally with a source code direct, uh, source code um, archive like this. And if you have a look at what's already installed in R on Arch2, you'll see there's a bunch of things that are already installed there for you. You can check that yourself using this R script minus E install packages once you've loaded the library and see what's there. So that's pre-existing software. Uh, then the other thing is, okay, I'm not using Python, I'm not using R, or I'm using Python and R, but I have some very strange or custom requirements. How do I then do that? Um, and the way we do that on, to try and support that on R2 is through something called containers. You may have heard of Docker in the computing world. Docker is a container um, and it's an approach to do containerization. Um, we're not actually using Docker, we're using something else called Singularity, but it works in a very similar way. And actually you can use containers from Docker in Singularity um, as well. Okay. So what, the, what is a container? It's actually sort of like a virtual operating system. So it lets you separate out the, the user space and the kernel space for operating systems and applications. Um, and you put an interface between them. So there's a virtualization layer between what the system's actually running, the Cray Linux environment, the operating system there, and then what you want to run on top of that. Um, and then it, uh, it, it lets you run a new operating system on top of that, which just calls down to the existing one that's already there. Okay. So um, the example, as I say, is Docker, where you get a file, um, you can get Docker images, and then you turn them into containers, which are things that run. Um, and you can get those from a hub. We use Singularity, because 
And one of the issues with Docker is it's not really set up for a shared environment where you've got multiple uh, users using the same system. So there are security uh, concerns about some aspects of Docker. So we use Singularity, which is more set up for the kind of environment Arch2 is. But it isn't the only kind of containerization you could use for Arch2. So there's, there's another one called Shifter or Charlie Cloud or those kind of things. But we've gone down um, the Singularity route, or at least Cray HPE have gone down the Singularity route. Um, Singularity is a little bit complicated because there are actually two different versions of it. Um, but um, we're using the app, the uh, app to innovation, I think, on Arch2. Uh, and you can have a look. It's sort of installed for you directly. And how does this work? Well, you can pull a, a, a Docker container or a, a other kind of container um, and build it on the system for yourself using the singularity command. So here's an example here. Singularity pull Python 3.9.9.sif from Docker. Here's an address. And that will come and create you a file called python 3.9.9.sif, which you can then run on later where you, uh, you can use to run later. So the command below that singularity run Python, Python minus C print hello, you'll see that it's actually running a command, a Python command inside this container. And that's how it works. And there's lots of containers out there. You can go and have a look at uh, this, this data set, datalad.org, or the Docker container um, hub where you can go and have a look. There may be things that are already pre-built that will have all the things installed that you need um, to run that as well. Um, there's different ways to run in, in uh, Singularity. You can, you can run, there's a run command to use, which will run the container. And, and when you define a container, you can define what command it will run when somebody runs it. So you can sort of have a pre-built executable in your container, which will run. And that's we, we use with Singularity run. And then the Singularity shell, which gives you an interactive session inside the container environment to do stuff in. And then you can do Singularity, singularity uh, exec, which will execute the command you specify at the end inside that container. Again, most of this is abstract. It probably doesn't make much sense until we actually play around with it. So um, it should make more sense when we get onto actual doing examples of it. We also have some pre-built containers on Archer 2 in this place work YO7 shared singularity images for things like large parallel applications or GUIs that let you visualize things. Um, and so let me have a look what's in there at the moment. Uh, I can demonstrate again to you. Um, so we can see we've got some Python containers in there, 3.9, 3.8. Um, we've got an MPI container here, so this is for large scale parallel applications. We've got an Anaconda container in there, Anaconda 3. Um, and then there's some other stuff, uh, Alpine and uh, XDIF. So individual applications that people want to run um, in there as well. So those are example applications. Example containers. So let me see. There's a question. There's a question here. Does Singularity get heavy use on Archer compared to bare metal? Uh, do you expect container use to increase in the future? No. So the answer is no. Singularity is not heavily used on Archer 2. Most of our users on Archer 2 are using large scale parallel applications that are already installed anyway. So if you look at our usage, we have our usage published online of our main codes that run there. Something like 78% of the main usage of Arch2 is, is a small set of codes which are already installed and we don't need containers for. Um, this kind of uh, singularity or this kind of container stuff tends to be used either for parts of a workflow which are not the main simulation, so sort of pre processing, post processing data, or for slightly um, slightly uh, more esoteric. Uh, use, uh, users just coming onto the system because if it exists on the system long term, they probably going to want to move beyond a container into something which is ported directly to the system because it can give you better performance. Not because the container itself, like Singularity, 
is particularly slow compared to running a bare metal. You say bare metal, so bare metal sort of means not running, running outside the container, just running in the system. There's not a huge performance overhead to running in a container. There may be for some things, some file operations and stuff, but in general, they're not. But what the container does mean is you're quite often not, um, you're not optimizing your code for the specific hardware you're running on. You're using a container because you have requirements which haven't been built or are not available on a um, compute node Linux. Um, and because of that, you're not compiling on the specific compilers or the specific hardware you're using, and that tends to mean you get less performance. And so containerization is, is, e is useful to make porting easy, but in the long run, you probably want to rebuild on the hardware to get the best performance out of it. You can build from a Docker file using Singularity. So I'll switch back to the um, I'll switch back to the slides in a minute, and that will show you exactly how to do that. Um, but yes, you, so you can take a Docker file and, and build a, a Singularity container from that. For those of you who know what those words mean, if you don't, then don't worry about it. You are living in a, a, a nice world where you don't have to worry about these kind of things. For you, if you you know if you don't know what Docker is and and all these kind of things, it's fine. All we're saying here is we have a way of building software. If you're struggling to install your software on Arch 2, or if you have a dependency which we is not installed, you can say, oh, actually, you can do that in a slightly different way. And that, we do do that for things. Um, the question was, there's also a question is, is sing, are containers or singularity like modules? Uh, not really. Um, a module system is a way of loading and unloading applications which have been built on Arch 2, which have been compiled on Arch 2, which have been ported onto Arch 2. So they just give you access to the applications. They don't do anything special or strange with the operating system and those kind of things. Um, whereas uh, a container is a way of bringing your software inside another operating system and running that directly on the system. So yeah, if you're doing Python, you can build your virtual environment uh, and work with that. You can absolutely build your virtual environment and, and, and install it and run it. The only reason you'd want to use a container is if you tried to install something in your virtual environment and it failed on install. It went, oh, I can't install this because I'm expecting to have library Y and Z and you haven't got them installed. Um, and you went and said, oh, can we get these libraries installed? And, and we told you, no, that's not supported on the system then you'd want to go okay can i do that inside a container instead that brings me those libraries that lets me set up my virtual environment and now go. if you can install your virtual environment or your anaconda or whatever it is on archer 2 directly then that's the way you would always go you wouldn't need the container it's only if you have these other software use cases where you that you run into problems because they won't install because you don't have other software installed which you're depending on uh, you know, a lot of people come, particularly in the data science world, come from systems where you're running Ubuntu, you have pseudo access, and you can install whatever you want. And that's not the environment we're on here. This is, you have an operating system that's been given to you, you can build code on top of that, but not all the dependencies you will need and will necessarily be there. And, and one way to get around that is to use containers. Um, I hope that's answered all your questions, but if not, ask some more. Um, because it's a good, uh, good to clear up any misunderstandings here, um, and any uh, issues with my explanations. So again, you do, most of you will probably not need to worry about this, but some of the issues around containers and singularity. Um, when you log in to a container, it will also automatically bring in your users and groups from the host system. So that means you have access to file permissions and things like that that you had on the system before that's good but it doesn't automatically the way a container works it doesn't bring in the file systems you have by default so when you create a container and you start it up it will give you access to your home file system directory and nothing else by default and as an example here if i do singularity shell of this container here hello world.sif and i say where am i it'll put me in my home directory but I won't be able to see anything outside that home directory and the stuff inside it. However, you can bring in extra directories using this, what we call a bind path, 
minus capital B. So I can bind in the singularity directory so I can access my work file system from that as well. So I can do my bind work to zero. And then inside that, I would be able to go inside my container to slash work slash Z19 slash Z19 slash Adrian J. Adrian J. You can also rename those inside your container. So you can say, well, take that work directory, but don't, I don't want to go to work Z19. I just want to call it work directory. And, and, and that's fine as well. The way containers work, that everything inside that container is read only. You can't update or change the operating system when you're running it. The only things that are accessible and, and modifiable are your home directory and the bind directories you bring in. So any of these extra directories here. And then in those, you can make changes. Um, OK. And then you can run, so we can use these then on the um, App on the compute system. Uh, so we can just use Singularity as an application and run container inside that. So that's perfectly possible like this. If you're wanting to do parallel containers where you have MPI applications inside that, it requires a bit more work. So you have to do all this setting up stuff of environment variables here. So again, don't worry about that too much. Most of you won't be doing this. But if you come along and go, I've got actually my data science application is already parallelized with MPI, and I want to use an Arch 2, but I'm struggling to port it across and, and compile it directly. So I want to use a container, and this is the kind of thing you would have to do. It's not terribly hard. It's just a bit fiddly, uh, and we can help with that. Uh, and these are sort of the complexities of doing this on the system. Now, the example um, in the exercise notes uses this a bit as well. So there's a there's a we, we run a parallel container and we use some of these commands, but don't worry too much about them. OK. There are different ways you can run parallel containers in Arch 2. Again, most of you I don't hear on this course don't, won't be doing this, but there's two different ways. We can either build a container with the same MPI libraries in it as are on the main system and connect them together, or we can do this bind mode where we connect the container with no MPI libraries into the main systems MPI libraries and, and compile there. Again, if none of those words mean anything to you, that's fine. Don't worry about it. You don't, you don't need to use containers or parallelization, uh, but just be aware if you can come back and, and want to do a parallel container, then come and talk to us about how you do that. And this is a, a, an example Docker file for building a parallel container using MPI on the host. Again, don't worry too much about it. One of the nasty things about containers uh, is where you can't build and you can't modify a container on Archer 2. The reason for that is that, that to, to create a new container, not just use somebody else's and pull it off a Docker hub or somewhere like that, or use one of the Archer 2 installed ones, to create a new one where you've got different software inside it, you actually need a system where you have root access, where you have pseudo access, because you need to be able to modify the container and then compile it down. And that requires root access. So, but you can do that locally. You can do it on your own system if you have root access there. You can use an image uh, a, a file like this one here. It's a, this is a Docker um, container image file, and you can build that and then build it um, on your your local system using Singularity, you'd have to install Singularity locally, or you can build it using Docker um, in a similar way like this, and then copy that container across onto Arch2, and then you'll be able to use it. Okay, and I've done this quite a lot. I have a Linux system virtual machine installed on my Windows system that I'm talking to you from now. I build a container on there, I modify it, I copy it over to Arch2, I use it. If I need to add some new packages in, I modify it locally. I update it and then I send it across to Archer 2. It's a bit of a faff, but you can do it. Again, if you're not using containers, you can ignore all this kind of stuff. But if you are getting into more complex containers where you need to write your own, you need to change the software that's installed in them, and there isn't one out there that already works for you, then this is the kind of thing you're going to have to do. So there's lots of software already available in Archer 2. 
these kind of systems are much more usable in terms of installing new software than they were in the past. But there are still corner cases where it might be hard to install your software on them. In general, if you're doing data science, you can take the Python that R that's there, you can build your own virtual environment, um, you can build your own uh, setup and then just use it as it is. As long as you install everything on the work file system and set up your installations to point to a work file system, you should get on fine. More complex things where you're struggling to install, then a container might be the way to go. Uh, and it's relatively straightforward and there's lots of examples out there, but it can get more complex if you wanted to do more involved things, but we can help with that. If you're gonna be using large amounts of compute um, and running lots of jobs, it may be worth moving away from the container thing in the long run because you may get better performance by optimize, porting and optimizing your application directly on the system rather than through a container level. Not because containers themselves are particularly slow, but because that lets you compile your application for the specific hardware we're running on, target the specific optimized communication libraries and, and uh, scientific libraries on Archer 2, and that may give you some benefits. Any questions? Okay, so I realize that's a lot of uh, detail, a lot of stuff we've gone through in the morning and we haven't even touched data science. So, you know, apologies for that. Um, but we should be at the level now where we can go on after lunch, one till two, to talk about Python and R and the specifics of how you'd use them or Arch 2. And we should also be at the point where you understand a little bit about the hardware on Arch 2, how to run a job, and now we've started looking at how you install software and how you build software. The task now is to, uh, you can keep going on with the exercises one and two if you've not finished those or you've got more questions about those, it's perfectly fine. Sorry, I went to uh, share the screen and close the tab instead. Uh, so give me a second. I was going to say if I um, share a different screen, uh, Chrome tab. Um, the other thing we can do now before the break is have a look at practical three, which is software installs and containers. So this lets you play around with a guide you through playing around with installing your own Python software in the work file system. Okay, installing your own R software in the work file system. And these are useful because these are bits of software we'll use in the next practicals. So try those out. Um, and then you can play with containers a bit as well, just if you want to see how they work. There's a practical on pulling down containers, building your own containers and, and getting them up and running on the system. Okay. So have a look at those. As I say, if you want to, to go to the, to finish off the first practical or have a look at the file system performance one as well, which is not very complicated, hopefully you can do both of those, but then go on to a practical one. I'll be around here till one, then we'll take a break, one till two, and then we'll come back at two for uh, a talk around um, Python and parallel Python on Archer 2. Uh, and then we'll play around with that, have a break, talk about R, play around with that, finish. Any questions? So there's a question here, what sense is it an optimized Python? Um, what it is, is it, it's the Python that's optimized generally for the Arch2 installs is NumPy, SciPy, um, and the MPI for Py and Dask. So these are packages that are heavily used in Python, but effectively uh, are doing computational, high computational workload things. Uh, and the way it's optimized is that they, those components have been installed to utilize the uh, 
Cray scientific libraries or simulation libraries which are um, optimized on the system. Uh, so we'll, we'll cover this in more detail in the next lecture, but basically it's been installed such a way that um, you're not using a sort of default BLAS library or a generic um, maths library for some of the high intensity work in things like NumPy, SciPy uh, and those kind of things that are built there as well.